Wilkie Collins wrote the book The Moonstone in 1868. It pioneered the contemporary detective fiction and set many of its standards. Colonel John Herncastle and his cousin take part in the British invasion of the Indian Syringapatam in 1799. They hear a tale about the Moonstone, a mythical Indian gem used in Hindu holy rites. Because it has three priesthood guards who are continually watching it, the diamond will curse anybody who tries to take it. During the assault on the palace of the Indian ruler, Herncastle's cousin discovers him in the armory with a big gem in his hand, having just murdered the Indian guards. Herncastle's rudeness alienates the family upon his return. The narrative jumps ahead 50 years in England, off the coast of Yorkshire. Sister of Colonel Herncastle, Lady Verinda, is a widow who lives with her daughter at a coastal estate. Franklin Blake, Rachel's cousin who just completed his studies in continental Europe, will attend Rachel's 18th birthday party. Before her birthday, he shows up with Rachel's gift from her uncle, a diamond. The moonstone would be given to Rachel on her birthday if her mother were still living, according to a promise Franklin Blake's father made to Herncastle before he passed away. Lady Verinda questions if this is retaliation for her strained relationship with her brother. Franklin believes that someone is following him as he travels from London, as three Indian jugglers often appear nearby. During his visit before Rachel's birthday party, Franklin and Rachel develop a romantic relationship. On her birthday, he presents her the diamond, which she wears throughout the celebration, even when the three Indians arrive. At the party are her cousin Godfrey Abelwhite, who is similarly attracted to her, Mr. Murthwaite, a well-travelled explorer, and Mr. Candy, a local physician. Before the meal, Godfrey asks Rachel to marry him, but she declines. Over dinner, a debate over the applications of modern medicine develops between Franklin and Mr. Candy. Mr. Candy begs Franklin to take medication since he has been having trouble sleeping since giving up smoking for Rachel, but Franklin declines. After keeping her diamond in her unlocked cabinet overnight, Rachel discovers that it's gone the next morning. Franklin brings in the renowned Sergeant Cuff from London when the local police are summoned but fail to respond when needed. Betteridge and Cuff start by looking into a stain on Rachel's living room's door, but no one can locate clothing that has this stain. He is suspicious of Rachel herself, who has been behaving oddly ever since the diamond was found to be gone, as well as Rosanna Spearman, a previous burglar who is now a second housemaid. Rachel, who formerly spoke to Franklin with tenderness, now addresses him angrily. Cuff worries whether Rachel recruited Rosanna, the girl with a dubious history, to assist her in stealing the diamond in order to pay off obligations for a hidden part of her life. Rosanna has been behaving strangely as well. Penelope, Betteridge's daughter believes Rosanna is in love with Franklin. In addition, Rosanna is seen conducting errands after claiming to be sick in her room. After visiting Cobb's Hole, a fishing community, Cuff learns that Rosanna has bought chains, a metal box, and has gone close to the shivering sand quicksand section of the shore. He feels that something is buried in the quicksand. Being in the same home with Cuff makes Rachel want to leave and go to London since she finds it to be intolerable. When she leaves to reside with the Abelwhites, she remains silent to both Cuff and Franklin. Rosanna, hidden in the shrubs, overhears Cuff questioning Franklin about Rosanna, but Franklin states that he is uninterested in her. After searching for Rosanna, Cuff and Betteridge discover that she committed suicide in the quicksand, having left a letter with her friend Lucy Yolland. To ensure that Franklin Blake receives the letter, Lucy insists on meeting with him in person. Franklin feels abandoned by Rachel, so he decides to depart and spend a year travelling the continent, while Godfrey returns to London as well. 
Lady Verinda hears Cuff's accusations and refuses to think her daughter would commit such a crime, but she decides to inform her daughter about Rosanna's death to see if it would provoke a response. Since Cuff leaves the inquiry and the lady heads to London to see her daughter, her niece Drusilla Clack takes up the story. When Clack learns that her aunt is nearing the end of her life, she is in London paying a visit to Lady Verinda. Together with her attorney, Mr. Bruff, she discovers Lady Verinda's will. She overhears Godfrey making another proposal to Rachel, which she accepts despite the fact that she acknowledges she is still in a state of shock over another person who has committed an unspeakable act. Godfrey and notorious pawnbroker Septimus Luca were both recently in the headlines in London. They were both examined, bound, and blindfolded by what is most likely a group of Indians. Many believe Godfrey stole the moonstone and pawned it with Septimus Luca, but Rachel claims she knows who stole the diamond and clears him of any wrongdoing. Lady Verinda dies in the midst of Godfrey's marriage proposal. When Rachel stays with Mr. Bruff, he informs her that Godfrey is getting married to her for financial gain and that he has already looked through his mother's will. She calls off the engagement, and Mr. Abelwhite makes her leave the Abelwhites' home. Rachel continues to live with the Bruffs as Mr. Bruff takes up the narrating. Mr. Bruff is certain at this point that Septimus Luca has the diamond pledged to him. The adventurer informs Mr. Murthwaite, who is well versed in Indian religion and culture, that the Indians are waiting for the year long vow to expire before retrieving the diamond. Franklin Blake is given the narration, and he is in control of constructing the story's complete storyline. After his father passes away, Franklin inherits a large sum of money. He then goes to England and chooses to pursue the mystery once again. He gets and reads Rosanna's letter from Lucy while visiting Betteridge in Yorkshire. Rosanna had learned that the smudged nightgown belonged to Franklin, and she was in fact in love with him. She went to great pains to conceal her suspicion that he was the thief, burying the nightgown in the box in the shivering sand and giving him cryptic clues. All of this went unnoticed by Franklin, and after this horrible period, Rosanna committed suicide after hearing that he had no interest in her. Franklin brings this proof to Bruff even though he knows he did not steal the diamond. They understand that Rachel's actions are a result of her belief that Franklin stole the diamond. When they finally get together at Bruff's residence, Rachel informs Franklin that she witnessed him steal the diamond that night. Despite the fact that they are still in love, he walks away heartbroken. Franklin attempts to get in touch with Cuff and Godfrey as well as the other party goers, but they are both abroad, Godfrey is in Europe and Cuff is in Ireland. He is informed that the doctor, Mr. Candy, wants to speak with him. Franklin visits the doctor, but learns that Mr. Candy has trouble remembering and speaking after developing a fever the night of Rachel's birthday. He becomes friends with the odd-looking doctor's assistant, Ezra Jennings, and he learns from Ezra Jennings that Mr. Candy had intentionally added opium to Franklin's evening drink to aid in his sleep as a practical joke. Ezra Jennings is aware of the opium's unanticipated consequences since he often uses it to manage his pain. He hypothesizes that Franklin may have accidentally stolen the diamond that evening while under the influence of opium, and suggests an experiment that would recreate that evening in order to verify his idea. Although Franklin and Rachel have bonded and Franklin has been cleared of the crime he committed without realizing it, it is still unclear how the diamond arrived in London after being pledged to Mr. Luca. On the day the diamond is to be redeemed, Franklin and Bruff fly to London and attempt to stop Mr. Luca from leaving the bank. Sadly, they end up following the incorrect person and return home empty-handed. However, a young man called Gooseberry who works for Mr. Bruff pursues the right man, a tall, dark sailor, to an inn. 
The next morning, when Sergeant Cuff arrives at Franklin's house, the three men and Gooseberry head to the inn where they discover the dark sailor dead in his bed. The mysterious sailor is really Godfrey Abelwhite, who had bumped into the insane Franklin the night of Rachel's birthday celebration and had stolen the diamond Franklin had given him to put in his father's bank. Godfrey was living a second life and needed money to pay back trust money he had wasted. Godfrey was intending to take the diamond to Amsterdam to be broken up and collect the money after pawning it with Luca. He was also pursued by the Indians, who killed him and are now returning to their homeland. Despite Cuff's precautions, including phoning the officials in Bombay and sending men after them, the Indians are able to escape. Ezra Jennings passes away from his sickness, Franklin and Rachel are married, and they're expecting a child. Mr. Murthwaite starts going to India again. He sees the moonstone placed correctly on the statue of the moon god on one such voyage and watches the three Indian priests depart on their own pilgrimages. If you have any suggestion of which book I should summarize, please let me know in the comments, and if you enjoyed this, please like and subscribe.